Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. And today I have my amazing co-host, Tom Campbell. And since the retreat that I went to in a castle at the beginning of the year, we've been talking about virtual reality. Now, we've mentioned all the topics before, and I just want to sort of play on how the ego and fears come about. Because obviously, the fears are what keep us back. And to me, to me, the ego can evolve with us. I believe that as long as we're on a dimension like we're on, where we're kind of at the very beginning, maybe not totally the beginning, but we're certainly not even in primary school yet. I think we're, you know, kindergarten, maybe grade one or two. Um, We've got a lot of room to grow. And I think our ego also has a lot of room to grow. I think what happens is that our ego tends to put all of our situations in boxes. So our biggest fears kind of go into a box. And when anything triggers that box, the ego, instead of getting the mind to be, you know, more conscious, the ego kind of goes into autopilot and um, just sort of pulls that box up. And regardless of whether it's real, perceived, um, we kind of fall into that box and our triggers get and our fears get um, pulled to the surface and we go into that emotion kind of on autopilot instead of, you know, truly um, being conscious. So I believe that the ego can grow with us to a certain degree. I think at some point we won't need the ego, but as long as there's a lot of fear, um, I think ego is part of this dimension. It's part of our experience right now. Once we evolve to a certain point, I mean, I don't know what it'll look like. (laughs) I'm assuming we don't just need our ego to get up out of bed in the morning and don't need our ego just to push us to work. I mean, there are things that we actually love to do. And so I think, you know, in some cases, I don't know. I think the ego gets a little bit of a bad rap. I really honestly believe that we can grow with our ego as long as we become more conscious and we're consciously looking at our fears. So I don't know where you fall on this. I know we've talked about it before. Um, So a good refresher, kind of bringing it into the virtual reality world that we've sort of been talking about so that it sort of all falls into place. So on to you, Tom. Okay. (laughs) Again. I think I think there's going to be, there was some confusion here on what is ego and, you know, because sometimes people get the idea that ego is just a sense of self and that that is ego, but that's not really true. That is, that's a pretty good approximation, but that's not the whole story. So let me break it down and define ego um, very precisely. And that is that, Ego is awareness in the service of fear. Oh. That's ego. Awareness in the service of fear. Now, what we also have awareness in the service of love. Okay. Now, Freud called that superego. Okay. He had an ego and a superego. And and he didn't say it this way, that ego was awareness in the service of fear, but that's what it was. That was... That's the self of I am. It's about me. Okay, that's in the service of fear. Love is about other. So if it's about love, then it's about other. Right. If it's about, you know, fear, then it's about yourself. Fear is very self-focused. Fear is just about us. It's all about us. This is our fear, right? So fear is just about us. Love is about someone else. So that's kind of the basic definition. So ego is self-awareness in the service of fear. And most of our sense of self is ego. But what we're trying to do is have less and less ego and actually get rid of the ego when we get rid of the fear and more and more of what Freud called superego. And superego 
is our own awareness in the service of love, in the service of other, you see, in the service of caring. And um, things like altruism, um, you know, when we, when we care about other people, uh, our, our sense of empathy with other people, all these come out of awareness in the service of other, in the service of love. You see, and that's what we're trying to, to create more of. And awareness in the service of fear is what we're trying to create less of. So that's why ego is then a product of fear. If you had no fear, you'd have no ego. So when you get rid of the fear, you get rid of the ego. But if we kind of jumble both of those concepts up together, then it gets a little confusing. Because then it think then it kind of think of well ego is just a sense of self. Well, for the most part, for most people, most of the time, their sense of self is ego. Their sense of self is you know in, you know their awareness and the service of their fear. We have all sorts of fears, and and most of us make most of our choices most of the time based on fear but we're not all fear. We also have some love. And sometimes we make those choices based on caring and it's about others. So we're a mixture of both of those things. But the average person walking around out there is probably, you know, 80%, 90% making their choices based on fear and some much smaller percent making their choices based on love. And that's the problem. It's that fear that locks us in. It's that fear that gets us in the box, as you say, we have a hard time, you know, seeing past our own stories and our own beliefs and our own fears. We, we feel inadequate. We feel unworthy. And because of that, we got upset when people say things that would indicate that maybe we were inadequate or not worthy because that, that strikes a chord with us. It, it uh, resonates with our fear. So when we, when we do, when we feel and express negativity, when we feel angry, when we feel upset, when we feel annoyed, when we feel, you know, uh, not appreciated, all those things that people feel, then that is ego. And that's fear. Because you fear that you, you know, are uh, the fear of being unworthy means you fear that if people aren't nice to you, well, it's because they don't like you. Well, they don't think much of you and that sort of thing, which resonates with our fear of being unworthy. And then we get angry. So they say something that insults us and we immediately get angry because we have to defend ourselves. Right. And that we wouldn't have to defend ourselves if we didn't have that fear. Right. If we didn't have the fear, we could just kind of talk to them about their opinion of us and, and maybe uh, help them see it differently or understand why they have that viewpoint. And uh, you know, we would find that a, an interesting subject and we'd like to explore more of it. And if there's anything we can help that person see better then we'd like to do that, but we don't get angry. We just work the problem you see. And as soon as you get angry, you stop working the problem and just feed the problem. You make the problem worse by your, by being angry. So that's kind of the viewpoint that we need in this, this ego, um, Fear. That's the ego fear connection is that, you know, ego is a result of the fear. Most beliefs are a result of the fear. We believe all sorts of things because that's what we want to believe, because that's convenient for us to believe, because it makes us feel better about ourselves. So, you know, we like sometimes to put other people down because it makes us feel better about us. Oh, those people, do you see what they were doing? Yeah, you know, they just don't understand anything. Well, the sub the subtitle or the you know the what's lying underneath that putting other people down is I'm better than that. Mm -hmm. I'm not that way. You see, what you're doing is giving yourself a pat on the back, making yourself feel better about yourself by putting other people down. And some people who uh, you know, I guess we could just call them complainers, where they're constantly engaged in negativity. They're constantly complaining. They're constantly put others down. They're constantly point a finger. They're constantly, uh, you know, talking about other people and how other people are messing it up, how other people aren't doing it right, how other people are this and that and the other. 
and they just have this constant stream of negativity, well, that's because they have a lot of fear and they have a lot of belief and they have a lot of ego. So belief and ego are created by our fear for, you know, for the most part. I'm talking mostly in generalities, like the way it is most of the time. So that's why, um, you know, we talk, we talk about the ego is a bad thing. We do want to get rid of that ego. So we're not just talking about a sense of ourself. There is that other sense of ourself, just knowing who we are and how we are and, and understanding the way we are, even understanding our problems and understanding our fear and understanding our, you know, our ego and our beliefs. And that's good. You know, that's a part of us that is working toward growing up, toward getting rid of our fear and seeing things just the way they are, not through the lens of our fear. And that's good. Of course, we're self-aware. When somebody gets rid of their fear, it doesn't mean they, they no longer know who they are. They've lost their identity. You know, they still have an identity. But that identity is no longer in the service of their fear. That identity is just their identity. And they can use that identity in service of others. You know, how can I help? What can I do? Instead of what's in it for me. You know, how can I get, how can I get mine and keep it? It's just different ways of approaching reality. So that's, that kind of gets rid of the confusion. And also, you've probably heard me say this, the old saw about, uh, you know, you can't love anybody else till you love yourself. And you see, that's a problem. <laughs> if you, if you approach things from my direction, you know, loving yourself is narcissism. And it's not about loving yourself, but you do have to like yourself. Because it's fear, it's fear, particularly the fear about yourself, the fear about being inadequate, the fear about, you know, being insecure. You don't like yourself. You see yourself as flawed. You see yourself as somebody who messes up. You see yourself as not being good enough. You know, you can't work if somebody's looking over your shoulder because it makes you nervous because they might catch you doing something wrong. Right. You see, that's, that's fear. And that is the problem. So it's not a matter of that you need to love yourself. That's unhealthy. It is a matter <laughs> well, it of... That's narcissism. It's unhealthy. That, that's narcissism. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but the fact that you do have to like yourself, you have, well, I should even put it differently. You have to not feel negative about yourself. That's probably the, the most exact way to say it. It's that you have to not feel negative about yourself. Because if you feel negative about yourself, then you don't really have much to give others because you don't credit yourself for having much. I'm inadequate. I'm insecure. You know, I don't have a whole lot to give others because I'm not much. You see, whereas if you are secure and you are caring and you care about people, then you have a lot to give others. You have a lot of love. You have a lot of caring. You have a lot of empathy. You have a lot to give. But when you are self-centered, then you don't have so much to give. So the self-centeredness is ego. You see, if it's all about me and what am I going to get? And okay, I meet you. And I, what I think in my mind was, you know, is how, how can I use you? What is it that you can do for me? You see, then it's all about me. Well, then what do I have to give? Well, I'm not going to give you much of anything because it's all about me. You see, so when it's when you have this ego and the ego is there to uh, deal with your fear, then you don't have a lot to give. Your capacity to love is smaller. So we all have a, a huge theoretical capacity to love, but we also have a practical capacity to love. And in as much as we have fear, in as much as we are self-centered, then that capacity of love, that practical capacity of love is much smaller. You just can't give that much. You still might act friendly. You still may be polite, but you just can't give that much. Your relationships with other people are always going to be shallow because you maybe give everything you've got, but that just may not be much because most of what you have is self-centeredness, is fear. You know, it's about you. So you're in a relationship and you think, well, I just want to love this person, but 
I really need them to be this way, this way, this way, and this way, because if they're not th that way, then I just can't be here. You see, well, that's all about you. And when it's about you, then it's not about other, and it's about being self-centered. It's about your fear. It's a fear that you won't get those things. So that's kind of how this, this unscrambles. It's ego is not a good thing, and we need to get rid of it. Awareness in the service of love, that's a very good thing. And that includes our sense of self, who we are and what we are. Not a fearful viewpoint of that, because the fearful viewpoint of who we are is, oh, we're flawed. We're, we're needy. We need people to, to say and do certain things for us. And if they don't, then we get upset because then we imagine they don't like us or don't care for us or don't appreciate us. Okay, well, all of that is your fear. You see, that's your ego. Whereas just understanding who you are and your identity, well, there's no fear there. That's just who you are. So we don't, don't confuse ego with just sense of self. It is that. And for most people, the largest part of their sense of self is dominated by their fear. But there's still parts of everybody that has some love in there, caring. You know, so we're not in to totally fear. We're just trying to change that ratio between how much of us is fear and how much of us is, is love. So we can get rid of the fears and become more love. That's the idea. So... It's that superego is what we want to feed. And it's that ego we'd, we'd like to, you know, to not feed. And is we'd there like any to... way that those two can, can the ego evolve to the superego or are they just literally like separate entities? Like are they? Yeah, they're just separate things. It's not that the ego evolves. The ego um, hopefully just dissolves, not evolves. It just dissolves. And as it, as it dissolves, the superego grows. Okay. You see, it's kind of a zero sum game in that sense. Yeah. If you get rid of, the more you get rid of the ego, the stronger your superego grows. That part of you that isn't just looking out for number one, okay. you know, that part of you that cares about others. Now that doesn't mean that you can't take care of yourself. You see, so you can, take care of yourself. You have to think about, you know, you have to think about yourself, about the, the uh, responsibilities you have. You know, you have to pay your bills. You have to get up. You have to take a shower in the morning and comb your hair. You know, you have to make your bed. You have to keep your place neat. There's a lot of things you have to do. You have to go to your job and you have to do your job well so you don't get fired, so you can pay the mortgage, you know, and pay the bills, you know, for your children and that sort of thing. So you have a lot of responsibilities and things to do, and you have to be aware of all of those. And you have to be aware that you're, you know, you'll be more successful at work if you do take that shower and comb your hair first before you go to work. You know, because appearances are important out there because we tend to live our lives based on appearances more than we do based on reality. So those, those appearances are important. And you have to be aware of those things. So it's not being aware of yourself that is the problem. Right. It's being aware of yourself. You know, it's that self-awareness in the service of fear. That's the problem. And that's what we're calling ego. So you can be aware of yourself, but being aware of yourself in the sense that you're in the service of you know, your family by keeping your job so you can pay your bills, so you can have good relationships with other people because that helps, you know, that helps everything else. You know, if, every, you, know, if you fight with everybody, then it's hard to get anything done. Everything's a, everything's a chore. So being nice to people, um, dressing appropriately for, you know, the right clothes for the right situation, uh, appearance, all those things are part of you getting along in the world. You know, you can't help people if people look at you and you frighten them. <laughs> you know, if you walk up to somebody and you've got a rubber ducky, uh, you know, in your hand and you're wearing uh, 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 flippers and you're carrying, a, a, you know, a rifle in your hands and that sort of things. And that people look at you and you look like you're insane or crazy or dangerous. You're not going to be able to help them. <laughs> so appearance is an important thing. You have to appear in a way 
that people can reach out to you, that people can talk to you and you can talk to them and that they will find credibility in you. And to some extent that has to do with appearance rather than with reality. Mm-hmm. That's just the social, you know, that, that's the, what should I say? The collective conscious, the culture that we find ourselves in. It's part of our collective conscious. So being aware of yourself and how you present yourself, you know, all of those things you could say, oh, well, that's all self, self-centered. No, it's not, ha- doesn't have to be self-centered. It can be self-centered. Oh, I want to look nice so that I can trick people and they'll believe me. I want to look nice so I can, you know, get that girl to pay attention to me. Well, all that's self-centered, yes. But you can say, I, I need to look good so that I don't frighten people, so that I, you know, so that I can connect with people. And then they uh, will, uh, you know, want to talk to me so that I can have relationships. I have to do my part. If I never take a shower, you know, and I smell bad, then it's just hard to be that useful to other people because whenever you're around them, they'll think negatively about you and they'll go the other way. So how can you be helpful? How can you give if you are like that? You see, so your own grooming and and caring about yourself is not a bad thing. It can be ego. If why, if what you're doing is looking the part so that you can manipulate so that you can get people to believe a certain way or think a certain way, in the sense that it's, it's all about you. But if it's about making it easier and more effective for you to help people and connect with people, then it's not self-centered. Then it's about love and it's about caring. So it depends on why, it depends on the intent behind it. So if your intent is to ma- manipulate people for your own benefit, then that's self-centered. If your intent is to connect with people, and you might even say manipulate, since we're talking about um, uh, image, to manipulate people so you can better help them, so you can better interact with them, so that you can care for them, so that uh, you know your interaction with them will be more positive. Well, then it's not self-centered. So it, it depends. We don't want to get hung up on words like manipulate, you know, because we can then get into a big argument anytime you do anything that that changes the way you interact with somebody you can say well that's a manipulation the point is why do you want to do that do you want to do that because it improves the quality of the relationship or do you want to do that because you're trying to get them to do something you want that's the difference so you know we can use the word manipulates not just necessarily an evil word but uh, mostly we use it that way we tend to use it in self-centered egotistical ways where we want to manipulate people to do the things we want them to do. The things that we know are even best for them, but that's still about us. Even if we think that that's about them, that's still about us. (laughs) Yeah. I know how you should be. I know how you should dress. I know how you should do these other things. And, and then you, we force ourselves on other people that way. And that's not good. So does that kind of, go through. Now, I haven't mentioned virtual reality yet, but uh, that's sort of the, the ego, superego, um, fear connection about, about love and caring and, and why loving yourself leads to narcissism. But liking yourself, or let's, again, saying not being negative about yourself is good. Because if, you're, if you have fear, then that's a negative about yourself. Right. That's mainly how the fear is manifested as negatives about yourself. And that limits how much you can love your capacity for love diminishes. So even if you're trying your best and you're giving it all you got, all you got may not be very much if you're a very self-centered person. But if you're in a relationship with a self-centered person, you have to realize that maybe they are just doing the best they can and just cut them some slack and not demand that they be somebody other than who they are. Accept them the way they are, that they are giving as much to it as as they can. They're making the best choices they can make, and they're just not going to do any better unless you give them a very safe space in which they can be different, you see. But as much as you complain to them and say, well, you're just not giving very much to this thing, Well, what that does is it makes their fear swell up even bigger 
and now their problems just got worse because now they have more fear and even a smaller capacity to give, to love, you see? So the thing to do is just realize people are the way they are. For the most point, everybody's doing the best they can with what they've got. And now you just have to let people be who they are, live with them the way they are, interact with them the way they are, and uh, not be negative about the way they are, not complain about the way they are, not try to fix them to be somebody else. They have to fix themselves. All you can do is give them a loving, caring, safe environment, and then hopefully they'll fix themselves. If you don't give them that, then it's unlikely they'll fix themselves. They may not fix themselves anyway. They may not be ready yet. But then you just accept that that's the way it is and love them anyway. Care for them anyway. And if they're really, really nasty people, then you may just want to avoid them. And that's the way it is. If, you have, if you're very, very self-centered, people tend to avoid you. They don't like being around you. Well, you know, then the thing is to change. So... Now, what does all that have to do with virtual reality? I guess we haven't gotten there. But all that has to do with virtual reality is because all of that is about growing the quality of your consciousness. And we have to grow the quality of our consciousness. That's evolving the quality of our consciousness, growing up, getting rid of fear. And as we get rid of that fear, we just automatically are more love. Love is the absence of fear. So... It's not that we have to do something special to grow that love. We just have to get rid of the fear that opposes it. So this, because, because we're consciousness and because we're trying to evolve the quality of our consciousness, we need an environment in which we can interact with each other that has meaningful choices, choices with consequences, choices where what we say and do makes a difference to other people and what they say and do makes a difference to us. So we need that kind of an environment, and that's why we get this virtual reality. We, that's why we consciousness log on to play human avatars here, because this virtual reality gives us that, that game where our choices are significant. And they have, you know, we get feedback, and we make choices, and they affect other people. Other people make choices and they affect us. So we're in this game where we constantly have choices to make that we can make them because we care and because we're love and because we care about other, or we make them because we care about ourselves. And we're making them to, to make sure we get what we want and to make sure that, you know, we don't get put down or nobody abuses us, that we're in, you know, we're here to look out for number one. That's all self-centered ego stuff. And that keeps you from growing up. So that's where the virtual reality comes in. The virtual reality is the context with which we, in which we grow up. It's the context in which we make choices. Choices that matter. Choices with consequences. Because if you're unhappy and you're fearful and you have a lot of ego and beliefs, the choices you make will tend to make your life unhappy. You make those choices based on fear, your life becomes a struggle. You're always struggling. Can't seem to ever quite get what you want and what you need. It always falls short. And you're always trying to manipulate and make sure that things go the way you want. And the poor choices create an unhappy life. The good choices create a happy life. If you're making choices based on other, then if you can make somebody else happy, you're happy automatically because you made somebody else happy because that's what matters to you is doing things for others. So it's a, uh, it's easy to be happy. Then it's not like you have to get other people to do what you want them to do for you to be happy. That's hard to get anybody to do anything else that they don't want to do. You see, so it's hard to find happiness when it requires them to do what you want. But if it only requires you to be nice and care for other people, and that's what makes you happy, well, now you're totally in charge of that. So happiness is just there. It's there all the time because you, you create it right in front of you. It's not created for you by other people. If it's created, if happiness is something that's created for you by other people, then 
it's going to be a struggle. You're not going to, you're not going to find that because everybody's sitting around expecting others to make them happy. You see? All right. So here's a room full of people and everyone, you know, wants everybody else to make them happy. Well, you can see that's not going anywhere. You know, that's a whole bunch of egos are going to be clashing with each other. Everybody wants to get out of the, of it, what they want. And, everybody's going to be unhappy with that situation where if ever you got a group of people and everybody's trying to help other people find what they need, well, then there's going to be everybody else in that group is going to be trying to help you find what you need. You see? So now everybody's happy. So you just see that in one side, if you're, if you're in the service of love, then your life is full of joy and full of happiness and everything works really well. If your life is, you know, full of fear, then your life is miserable and you're unhappy and you have a lot of pain and you can't ever seem to get things to quite work the way you need them because the way you need them is for other people to be the way you want them to be. And you don't control other people and that frustrates you. Mm -hmm. so it's a very frustrating existence. So that's just the two sides of it. And the virtual reality is the game that we play that puts us in that context to enable us to grow up. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a we wouldn't have a, a a situation that had these kinds of choices in them. So, could the larger con consciousness system have? At what point did they decide that the ego is the ego there to assist us to see the difficulties that we create when we have fear? Is it like what would have, what is the role if it's to be let go of, which of course it fights very hard to do <laughs> so that we don't do that. Yeah. I mean, well, an ego isn't like created. It's not a thing. Okay. The ego is just there because we have fear. It's the fear that creates the ego. So the fear is first ah. because we have fear. Then we have ego. We have, we have the ego because of the fear. Remember it's a, it's self-awareness in the service of fear. So if there is no fear, there is no ego. So it's not like ego is a thing. Ego is just a response to fear. And that response to fear mm -hmm. basically comes from the fact that we're not grown up yet. Right. You know, we have fears. We're not sure who we are, or if we're good enough, or you know, if we're going to succeed. We fear that people won't like us or won't appreciate us because we need to be liked and we need to be appreciated. Those needs come out of a fear that we won't be good enough to get that. And that, uh, you know, so we have, we start with the, with the fear and the fear comes because we are just consciousness. We have potential. We as consciousness have potential because we choose, we make choices and we interact with other consciousnesses. As we interact, then we have the pen potential to interact in a fearful way or to interact in a loving way. Those are, that's our potential. And when we start this game, we don't start at the top. We start at just, you know, ground zero. And what we did is when we had choices, and particularly when things, you know, what, 200,000 years ago when humanoids were just kind of walking the earth for the first time, life was tough. Life was challenging. Life was very difficult. And consciousness, given those choices, basically made fear-based choices. And we've been trying to outgrow it ever since. Well, the reason we made fear-based choices is because we hadn't really developed our potential in either direction. We hadn't developed it to be loving. We hadn't developed it to be fearful. We were just potential. But then we got thrown into this virtual reality or we logged on to this virtual reality and suddenly, you know, there's life and death situations. We don't have food, but those other people over there do have food. Well, there's more of us than them. Let's just go take their food <laughs> because that way we'll survive and they won't. So it was just that sort of thinking. It was about self. That's, that was the kind of choices that we made. We made choices to uh, take care of ourselves and our group. And that meant fighting with other groups keep them from taking our stuff and take their stuff when we could. So when we had those kinds of choices, rather than us say, Oh, look, there's another group. Let's share what we got with them. And maybe all together with more of us, we'll be able to you know, find more food. 
Well, we didn't think we didn't make that choice. We could have made that choice, but we didn't. We made the choice that it was about us, the fearful choice. If we don't get the food, you know, we're in trouble. Rather than, well, we're all in it together, you know, with twice as many people looking for food, maybe we'll we'll find enough for everybody. You see, it was a different way of looking at it. And until you're grown up, until you've made those choices where can you you can evolve the quality of your consciousness, well, your quality of consciousness just not evolved. And when it's not evolved yet, you're going to make the choices that are fear-based because your quality of consciousness hasn't evolved yet. So it's it's like this, you have to start at the beginning. And in the beginning, you're not particularly evolved. You just have potential. And when you're not particularly involved, you tend to make fear-based choices because that's what an unevolved consciousness does. It's full of fear. So you, that's, that's just where we start. And now we've been evolving the quality of our consciousness for about 200,000 years. And we've done reasonably well. Where we are today, here in the 21st century, is a whole lot kinder and gentler and less abusive and nicer than it was, you know, even four or 500 years ago, much less the 200,000 years. Hmm. It, uh, you know, we no longer live in the jungle where it's, it's, it's whoever's biggest, you know, gets, is in charge. You know, it's all about force. If you have more force, then you're in charge. Somebody else has more force and they're in charge. It's all about fear. It's all about force. And we generally don't live like that. Now, some parts of the world still are in that state, but there's a lot of the world that isn't. You know, we care more about people, about their potential, about their possibilities. Um, we think more about others. We have more empathy. We live in a smaller space now that we have the Internet and we can see what's going on in all the other places in the world. We have empathy for those people now rather than just kind of blowing it off because we never heard of that place. You know, it's like they don't even exist in our mind. So we're changing. We're evolving. That's good. And we started where we had to start, which was at the beginning, which was with a consciousness that was not very evolved, made choices based on fear because we weren't there yet. And now we're doing better. And in another you know, century, we'll probably be doing much better yet. Because the more you evolve, the faster it is to evolve more. It's like that, you know, the more you learn, the easier it is to learn more. So learning is very slow in the beginning, because everything is, you don't understand anything. But the more you, you know, the more your understanding grows, then the easier it is to learn more quickly the easier you can you can see what's going on and, and see big pictures. Whereas before, you're just kind of trapped in a little picture and you don't have a big picture. Or you make up a big picture and it's a scary big picture. You know? So we're, we're moving right along. You know, everything is working. Yeah, it does still look like we've got a long way to go, but that's all right. We're, we're chugging along and now we have the ability to, to grow even faster than we had before. So. It's all good news. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess therein lies the issue around ego, though, is that, you know, we think we're evolving it when we become, you know, more spiritual, and then, unfortunately, the spiritual ego can be just as, well, damaging. <laughs> as anything else or you know the person who has good intentions like becoming a vegetarian because you know they don't want to you know injure other animals but then they become self-righteous and judge and you know justify so then their ego gets i mean it's it's a it's a slippery slope to <laughs> <laughs> it is it is indeed and we can we make you know, one step forward and slide a half a step back, you know, a lot. Yes. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm a spiritual person now, so I'm better than you are, right. you know, that sort of thing. As soon as you do that, of course, that's ego. Right. You know, it's about you and how much better you are and how much worse they are. And now we're back into putting other people down to make yourself feel good. And exactly. Yeah. I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat animals and you still eat animals. So I'm superior to you. Yeah. And if we, we have those attitudes, then we just climb one baby step at a time, you know, 
out of the fear. And it's, yeah, no, it's very rare that a person takes a giant leap forward. You know, it does happen sometimes where people suddenly, aha, and things fall into place and they take a big step forward and let go of a whole lot of fear. But most people don't grow up that way. Mostly it's one small step after another after another. And you only notice it when you look backwards and you look back five, ten years you know, before and you can see how different you are now. The way you approach things, the way you see things, the way you interpret things. It's just so much different than it was. But you don't notice it day by day by day. It's just small things. So, yes, you give up eating animals because you don't want to kill sentient beings just because it pleases you. It's just for your pleasure. You can have a healthy, balanced diet and feel fit and trim and exercise and even be athletic and still be vegan. So if you kill animals, it's not because you need them to survive. It's because you like their taste. Because it's your habit. That's what your parents did and your grandparents did. And that's what everybody else does. So out of habit and out of pleasure, you kill things that are sentient, doing the same thing we're doing. They're also making choices and growing. Their consciousness, their conscious beings as well. Anything that makes free will choices is, is conscious. So if you do that with a sense of understanding and you do it because of caring, then good. But then you turn around and make that, you know, something that makes you feel superior, then, eh, well, okay, you took a step forward, but you're not there yet. You still have a ways to go. We can get puffed up about all sorts of things. Yes. And you just have to constantly assess what is your reason for feeling the things you feel, for saying the things you say. What is the reason there? When you look out at other people and say, well, I'm more grown up than you are, what's the reason for that? Why would you think that thought, you see? And when you think about it, well, the only reason you'd think that thought is you're patting yourself on the back. You're saying, oh, look how good I am relative to them. And why would you want, why is it necessary to pat yourself on the back? Well, because you have a fear that you're not as good as you should be. So that's why you need to pat yourself on the back. If you didn't have that fear that you were not as good as you should be, the fact that you had a higher quality of consciousness than other people would just be a fact. It wouldn't be something that, oh, I'm better than them. It'd just be, we're different. It wouldn't be a better or worse. It's just, we're different. If anything, it would create some compassion for those people who were still struggling in an area where you used to struggle but you're not struggling anymore. So then that triggers a, you know, a want and a need, to, or I shouldn't say a need, it, it, it triggers a feeling of want to be helpful. And you know that by giving them a lecture isn't going to be helpful because, you know, that's all about you again. You know, listen, people, I'm going to explain it to you. And if you listen, you'll be as good as I am. You know, that's not being helpful. So, yeah, growing up as a, as a, complex thing that happens very slowly and you in order to do it you just have to want to do it if you have the intent to do it you will you will just slowly grow up and years later you'll look back and you'll be a whole, totally different person because grow, the growing up changes you makes you somebody different yes and you have to just keep monitoring yourself like you said like you have to you know, know what your intentions are and then not let that little voice that tends to want to say, Oh, look, look, they're not anywhere near you. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, that little, that little voice where you go, Oh, they're crazy. <laughs> you know? Or, you know, that just that, you know, that slides in there that you're not even aware of because it's, you know, most of the time we're living on autopilot. So it's like, that little voice, not the gentle, loving voice, but that little one that nags at you because you still have all these fears. Even if you start, you know, facing those fears, there's still that little, I mean, it can be so minuscule and yet it slips in and creates the doubt and then create, you know, the fears get out yes. there. Yes. So people who are say have higher uh, have more evolved consciousness have, a, have have evolved their consciousness more okay people who are like that it's not that they don't know that they are different than say 
an average, the average, let's say they're above average in quality of consciousness. It's not that they don't realize that. It's that that doesn't matter. That's not important to them. It's not something that they look at and are going to be proud of. It's just a fact. Okay. I remember when I was like that. I remember when I got angry. I remember those things, you see, and now you have compassion for other people. It's not like I'm better, but you realize that you're different. It's not that you know, again, when you get rid of ego, doesn't mean that you become unaware of yourself. You know, it's not like your your awareness of yourself disappears. You're still aware of yourself, and you're aware of other aware, people. More aware, probably. Yeah, more aware, and you're aware of the differences. Right. But those differences aren't something that you hang ego on. Those differences are just differences. That's all. And if anything, those differences mean that there's an area where you can help. There's an area where you now are more able to help because you have a bigger picture. You've been there and done that. You've experienced that. And you know maybe the path that helped you go out, get out of that and grow up. And you might be able to be helpful to somebody. So that's the way you approach it. Not look at me. I'm better than other people. You just don't see it that way. You just see it as you have responsibilities to do what you can to be helpful and not to make things worse. And how can you do that? How can you best apply it? So it's just, you know, when you have a lot of ego, it's hard to imagine people who don't. <laughs> because it's just not the way you are. It's not the way you think. And you think, yeah, well, if somebody was really better than everybody else, they certainly would feel better and, you know, more, more evolved and, and whatever, you know, that they would have ego with it but it's not the way it is. Those who evolve the quality of their consciousness also remain humble. Humility goes with it because the more you know, the more aware you are of how much you don't know. <laughs> you know when you don't know much, you think you know almost everything. <laughs> but when you know a lot, you know there's so much more you don't know and that you've got a lot of room for growth and a lot of ways yet to grow up. So just being more aware actually makes you more humble rather than less humble. Hmm. Well, I like this conversation. I think it, um, well, it brought me more clarity. <laughs> I think it's a little bit slightly different than what we've talked about in the past. Uh, not the fear part, but I like the aspect where you said that ego is in service to fear. Is that how you put it? Yeah. Ego is awareness in the service of fear. So we as consciousness are awareness. We're aware of things and we interact and operate on the things we're aware of. Okay. We're, we're self-changing. We're evolving things, but our awareness is the key thing. That's what we are. We're aware. And then we make choices based on what we're aware of that awareness. So that if that awareness is in the service of fear, if that awareness is trying to, you know, make you feel bigger and better, trying to make you feel, uh, you know, deserving of everybody's praise, trying to make you feel, you know, if it's fear-based, then that awareness is what we call ego. It's, it's about you. And the reason it's self-centered and about you is because fear is always about you. And then you grow past that and your awareness is not so much focused on, on, um, uh, of the fear. So you're just growing up. You're in that process. You let some of that fear go. Now more of your awareness is focused on how can I help? How can I be part of the solution here? How can I make other people feel good, feel happy you know, in a relationship? How can I make that significant other feel happy? And that significant other may still be very self-centered. That doesn't matter. You don't say, oh, they're more self-centered than I am. I need to find somebody as good as I am. You know, that is not the point. That's just more ego and fear. The point is they are who they are. And they obviously had some qualities or you wouldn't have gotten in that kind of relationship with them. So you accept it just the way it is and give them the space and the, and the security for them to grow themselves up as they will. You know, they have to grow themselves up. But the most you can do for them is to give them that safety and that security. They're loved, unconditional love. 
nothing they can do is going to make you, you know, not like them, be upset with them, spurn them, nothing. Your love is unconditional. Okay, so when they have that feeling, then they can take some risks on expressing their vulnerabilities, on, you know, dealing with their fears. They can reach down and deal with those things now because they feel safe and secure. Well, now they will do that when they're ready for it. Whereas if you keep hounding them about their, their, you know, gee, you're awfully self-centered, you know, you're not as good as I am. You know, if you give them all that stuff, well, now they're just going to retrench down. You know, they're going to, they're going to crawl in a hole and put up their defenses, put up their walls, and you're just going to get a lot of sniping going on, you know, so they're going to send things back to get even to get you for making them feel bad about themselves. And then you've just created a dysfunctional situation. So it's, you know, a relationship only requires one person to love. It doesn't have to be equally matched or anything else. It's, It's just two people, two people who can enjoy each other's company and enjoy being around each other and can share things with each other. They don't have to be even or equal or, anything else. They just have to care about each other, love each other in as much as they're capable. And they can only love to the point at which they're capable. And that capability depends on how much fear they have. And they can only get rid of their own fear. You can't get rid of anybody else's fear. And they're only going to get rid of that fear if they feel safe. You see, so that's the, that's kind of, you know, the key idea about relationships. It's not, am I getting as much as I'm giving? That's just fear. Fear that I'll be taken advantage of. Fear that I'll give more than I get. Oh, wouldn't want that. I need to get at least as much as I give and maybe a little more would be better. You know, it's better to get more than you give because that's getting is always better than giving. You know, if you have that kind of an attitude, then you're going to be struggling and unhappy and not have good relationships. You can't have good relationships with an attitude like that. Unless perhaps you have somebody else in your relationship that can love and is a very loving person and has a high quality of consciousness. And then they will just smile at you and say something to make you feel better and you'll go on. You see. Now you mentioned something about how fear is just about self. And I know that there's somebody that's going to say, well, no, but I, I had fears about other people. But when you think about it, the fear that you have of other people is how you're reacting. (laughs) It's still about you. (laughs) It is still about you. But, or fear what's happening to other people, but it's how it's relating to you. Right. Exactly. It's how it's relating to you, how it's going to make you feel. Exactly. Okay. I have a, you know, I have a, a child and a child is, 14 years old and on their first date with a bunch of friends. And, you know, they've gone off with an older friend that's 16 and just able to drive a car and the parents are sitting home terrified because, you know, the little girl, the little boy's out of the house for the first time and all, they think of all the horrible things that could possibly happen, you know, automobile accident, this, that, you know, go do drugs, whatever it is, you know, get bullied. They have all these ideas about all the horrible things that could happen. But, Yes, they are fearful, but it's, it's, I don't want those things to happen. And it's, it's, and if they do happen, I will be upset. I fear that these things will happen. You see, I have a fear that these things will happen. Well, that's your fear. Your fear is that they will happen. And yes, it's about somebody else in the sense as you, your fear is that something will happen to somebody else, but it's still your fear. You see, you've got the fear. So that is your fear that you're talking about. Now, if you were just concerned and said, well, life is risky. Things happen. But, you know, I've raised my child well, and I think they've got a sense of what's good and what's not. And I know the kids that they're going to be with. And, yes, things could happen because life is risky. But Children have to go live in this risky world. That's just the way it is. And you might as well start with small risks, you know, when they're 14 and 15 and 16, and they will learn how to deal with this world that indeed is risky. You have to let them take risks. You can't keep them away from risk. If you do, you'll damage them. 
you know, lock them in a closet and slide their food under the door. That way, nothing that bad will ever happen to them. Except well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is bad that's happening to them is the way you're treating them. Yes. So you can't keep people away from risks. So you do that. And then you have to have the courage that says, well, it, they're old enough now to take some risk. They have to start doing things on their own without a parent around to supervise. And if something happens that is, that is unpleasant, I'll deal with it. If I get a call about they've been in an automobile accident, I'll deal with it. If they get run over by a cement truck and everybody's killed, well, I'll have to deal with that. You know, you realize that life is like that and you'll have to deal with things and you'll deal with it the best way you can. But when you get to the point that says, no, I can't deal with that. That cannot happen. Things cannot be the way I don't want them. Well, now you are getting wound up in your own fear, you see. So that's the problem. If you can accept life, accept risk, Learn to live gracefully with uncertainty. Realize that you will deal and you can deal with anything you have to deal with. Not that you'd like to deal with it, but if you have to, you will because life is like that. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes those risks, you know, the, sometimes you get the bear, sometimes the bear gets you. <laughs> it's just the way life is. And you have to let your children go out into that scary world and make their own choices. You do it a little bit at a time where the choices they have to make are not really the, big, the biggest choices they'll ever have to make in their life because they're only 14 years old. So you make sure you know the people they're with, you know where they're going, you know, you have all the rest of that done. And now you let them get their feet wet a little bit in making their own choices. And then maybe when they're 16 or 17, you give them a longer rope. You know, you let them make more of their choices. And eventually, by the time they're 18, they're pretty much making their, all their own choices. And at that point, legally, they can tell you to go pound sand because they're of age that they're legally allowed to make their own choices. So they can move out and you know, go live someplace else if they want. So th that's life. So you have to be able to accept things. But when you can't accept and no, they must not be that way. I can't accept that. Well, now, you're, now you've got a fear. And now you're sitting at home, chewing your nails, pacing back and forth because you're full of fear. And it is about you. It's your fear. It's not that, oh, it's just because I care about somebody else. Well, you do care about somebody else, but you also care about you who cannot accept things other than what you want. So, yes, this thing about, well, it's just about somebody else. It's not about me. That's not right. Fear is fear. And if it's your fear, own it. You know, it's not there because somebody else makes you afraid. You always choose your fears. Nobody else gives you fear. It's not like, well, those children frighten me. They give me a lot of fear. No, you have a lot of fear. <laughs> and the fear is around your children. You know, they don't give it to you. That's yours. You need, to, you need to own it and you need to get rid of it. Because otherwise, you're always going to be pacing the floor. Sometime you need to let them grow up and go on and make their life and figure that, yes, bad things could happen, but good things could happen. And that's what life is all about. And accidents could happen, but they happen. You deal with them as you have to, and you deal with them as positively as possible. So that's kind of the grown up attitude. But very few people get there. <laughs> oh, now. <laughs> that's few, what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, very few people get there because it's hard. You know, that's, it's hard getting rid of fear. It's easy to say, much harder to do. Yeah. But it's necessary to get rid of fear. That's the only way you grow up. It's the only way life will get happier for you. Yeah. Yeah, I liked it. Well, I, this was a good show. I, sorry, I kind of like this show. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought there was some interesting little tidbits that Good. came in there that you were uh, the first you were the first to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Yay for me. <laughs> uh, okay, well, you have been listening to News for the Heart. We're beginning to the heart of what matters with Tom Campbell, and I'm not sure what we'll call this, but I kind of feel like it's something about ego and consciousness and fear i love it okay well thank you tom you're welcome Lori. thank you for the opportunity always have fun 
with you and what is it the last tuesday of every month there you go and we'll be back next month have a question for Lori and want to be on the next news from the heart show drop us a line via instant feedback at bmajor.org News from the Heart is brought to you by Intuitive Soul and is produced by Major Radio for Clear Channel's iHeartRadio and bmajor.org.